All right. Now listen, church, we have an opportunity. Uh, we have an opportunity to, to encourage and to speak encouragement into the lives of these young people and to, um, to build their confidence, to build their, uh, their spiritual walk. So I encourage you, the, the power of the high five is very effective. It's actually in the Bible. No, it's not. But give them a compliment. Invest in this generation. Um, today we are doing something fun. We're doing something fun. It, it's you Sunday. Every, every Sunday is fun. Uh, but today we're doing a, a, a first person narrative sermon. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take on the role of a character from the Bible. And I'm going to tell their story as if it's my story. So what I'm going to do is I will, I, will, I, will, I will pray and then I will turn around and when I come back around to face you, I will no longer be mild-mannered, slightly crazed coaching referee enthusiast, Mike Hasselring. I will be a character from the Bible, okay? And so this is, this is an opportunity for us to jump into the story and, and really try to put ourselves into the story, into the scripture, and see what it would have been like uh, to be the people uh, that, that interacted with Jesus, the people that were in the scriptures. And so uh, I am not the greatest actor in the world. I am not wearing a... Hey, this is my normal clothes. I'm not going to wear a special costume because uh, it would look horrible. So, but just, 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 just track along with me and let's, uh, let's jump into the scripture today. God, you have given us stories that are true, that tell us about who you are. And I pray that we can step into the scripture and see what it would have been like to meet your son. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. We thank you. Thank you so much for all that you've done. In the name of Jesus Christ, your son, we pray. Amen. Well, hello. My name is Shamar. I'm a, I'm a Samaritan, a good, faithful Samaritan, and I have a great family. Let me tell you about my family. I'm married. We've been married. Well, when this story happened, this specific story I want to share with you today, I'm married for about seven or eight years. My wife, Marion, great woman, faithful, loved Yahweh, creator God, great woman. And at this time in our life, we only had two kids. We had our daughter, Nama, who was six years old, our daughter, Nama, and our son, Caleb. At this time, he was four. They are the best gift from Yahweh God. Great young children. And, and Nama, our six-year-old, she loved to take care of the goats. That was her responsibility on the farm, and she did a great job of taking care of the goats. Caleb, now he's little, he's four, and his responsibility was to take care of the chickens. And for the most part, he did a good job, but sometimes, often, he got easily distracted. And, and I remember the specific day he, he found a, a little kitten, I don't know where he found the kitten, but he fell in love with this little kitten. And he carried that kitten with him everywhere. And I kept checking to see if he'd, he'd taken care of the chickens. And for the most part, all he did all day long was play with that little kitten. Well, this specific day that I'm, that I'm thinking of, I was in the back and I was working and I was cleaning up some of the brush in the back. And, and the kids were doing what they normally do, kid things. And, and it was getting dark and it was time to eat dinner. And Marion called us all in. So we came in for dinner and... And we sat and we enjoyed a meal. She's a great cook. And we, we shared stories about the day. And the cat was at the table. Caleb brought that cat everywhere. The kitten was everywhere. But that's okay. That was his thing. So we finished cleaning up the meal and got ready for bed. And we put the kids in bed and said our prayers and then tucked them in. And then got ready to go to sleep. Now you're thinking, wait, I thought you said you were a Samaritan. You're talking a lot about praying and about Yahweh God. Now listen, because a lot of people give Samaritans a bad rap. Okay, they, they think that we're, that we're mixed breeds and impure and, and that we don't have a relationship with Yahweh God, but that's not correct. That's not correct. See, see what happened was, was uh, we as Samaritans, we do believe in Yahweh God and we believe in the, in the Torah, his, his written first five books, of the, uh, the, of the prophet Moses, what the prophet Moses gave to us. Now the Jews, they picked up a couple extra books along the way that we don't agree with, but we agree on a lot of things and, and the Torah and Moses as being one of the prophets and, and, and what he told us about Yahweh God, we agree to that. And so we serve Yahweh God and we faithfully look forward to the day when Yahweh God 
would send another prophet. Much like Moses, but, but we're not really sure. And so we're anticipating and looking forward to that day. But you would think that our, our similarities would be enough to, to draw us together, but they weren't. And a, and a division between the two of us created. See, what happened was the Samaritan people, my people, my family, originally we were part of Israel. We were the northern tribes, and, and well, the northern tribes weren't doing what God wanted them to do. And so Assyria came in and, and took over uh, Israel. And they brought in their own people and they, they mixed into the community and you, you could call it community outreach, but we, my family, started marrying the Assyrians. And so the Jews and the Assyrians married together and it was a mixed race, the Samaritans. That's not that bad. That's not that big of a deal. It's, it's my family. We were still faithful to Yahweh God, but the Jews, they didn't like us and they let us know. At any opportunity that they had, they let us know. So there was some tension. And as a young person, I, I was all for it. You, you don't like me? Well, I don't like you, and I fought them tooth and nail. Every chance I got. I remember uh, just looking at the history that my, uh, my forefathers passed on to me. When the Jews finally got out of captivity, again, Judah, not doing what God wanted to do, and they were captured by Babylon. When they finally got out, they came back to Jerusalem. And they started rebuilding the walls and rebuilding the temple while we were there to make it difficult for them. My great-great-grandfather's being a pain. Way to go, guys. And they fought against them. Because we didn't need to worship at Jerusalem and the, and the temple there. We had our own temple. The Samaritans, we worshiped at Mount uh, Gerizim where we worshiped Yahweh God. Well, the Jews didn't like that we were fighting against them and so the schism drew even farther. And the tension was thick. It was, it was a done deal. Jews and Samaritans, we didn't get along. We didn't speak to each other. We didn't like each other. And that's how it was. Back to my story. So you see, we're not that bad. Samaritans, we're not that bad. We, we serve Yahweh God. We try to do the best. They fought us first. Back to that day. Caleb's got the kitten. Uh, Nama's got her goats put away. I went back out to, to the, the kids are in bed. I went back out to make sure everything was all shut up and, and locked up. All the tools are put away. And as I came back towards the house, I, I bumped against the fence and, and it reminded me that I had a, a little itch on my forearm. And I had noticed it earlier and I, I just thought it was poison ivy. I, I get poison ivy. I'm a little uh, susceptible to that. And so it's it's annoying because if you got poison ivy, you don't want to bump into other people because you don't want to share those kind of sicknesses. You don't want to do that. And so I thought, okay, poison ivy, not a big deal. I was out working in the back. I'll just wrap it up and, and keep an eye on it. So I did. I wrapped it up and I kept an eye on it. Well, it had been two weeks and it wasn't getting better. It had been two weeks and it was actually starting to spread. And I was getting concerned. And I remember that night, we put the kids to bed, and I asked my wife to come. I said, Miriam, I said, look at this. And I slowly unwrapped the bandage, and I showed her my arm. I said, I don't think this is poison ivy. And the blood just ran from her face, and she was white. And I looked at her and I said, I think I have leprosy. And we just started to weep. We started to weep because if I had leprosy, I'd have to leave. I couldn't be there anymore. Leprosy is a highly contagious disease. You, you get it from bumping into someone else who has leprosy, from, from being by them. And I couldn't stay at home because... If I had leprosy, it would just be a matter of time before my wife had leprosy and my kids had leprosy. And there was no cure. There was no cure. It was just a matter of time. Some had years. Some had shorter. It was a matter of time before you lost your life. She said, no, no, it can't be. It can't be. And I said, it is. Stay back, please. I have to, I have to go tomorrow to the priest at Mount Gerizim. And I have, to, I have to let him look and, 
and see what it is. And she says, no, no, just, just keep your bandage. Maybe it's poison ivy. You'll be okay. You have to stay here. And I said, I can't. If I stay, you risk getting leprosy. And I can't live with that. If I stay, the kids risk getting that. They're kids. They're always jumping on your lap, giving you a hug. You can't do that. And so, so I bandaged his back up. And we lay down to sleep. Neither of us slept. We just wept and cried and prayed and prayed. I called out to Yahweh God, why God, what did I do? See, most common, when you, when you got leprosy, it was because you were being punished for something wrong, some sin that was in your life. That was the common association. That's what made it even more humiliating to have leprosy because people looked at you and said, you must have done something wrong. And God's mad at you and he's punishing you with leprosy. Is it, is it something I did wrong, God? Is it a sin? Why, God, what did I do? And then the overwhelming sense of loneliness that this would be the last night that I ever get to, get to be in my house with my wife, my kids, it, it just swallows you whole and you just are empty and there's nothing inside because you know if the priest declares you unclean, you have to leave. Needless to say, we didn't sleep. We didn't sleep one bit. Caleb was the first one in the room with the cat and he came in all full of joy and energy like a kid who had no idea what was going on. So Miriam and I, we, we did our best to compose ourselves. And I, we ate breakfast and I told the kids, I said, listen, dad's got to go. He's got to go to the temple. And, and I'll be right back and it'll be okay. I packed my bags and I, and I went on this, this journey and I prayed so hard. Yeah, but God, please let this just be poison. I let it not be leprosy. And I walked what seemed forever. And I reached the temple. And I saw the priest and I unwrapped my bandage and he looked at my arm and he declared me unclean. He said, you have leprosy and I'd have to leave. Oh, I fell on my face. This was it. I'm, I'm, I'm losing my family. I had no strength, but I made it back home. I don't know how long it took me. I made it back home and I told my family, I have to go. The kids were a mess. They didn't know what to do. They were totally wrecked. I said, I have to go. I hugged them one last time with one arm. It's not the same. And I left and I left. There's a place for people like me. It's outside of the town where other lepers live. You could be sick with this disease for a couple of years. So you do the best that you can. You live there together with your other fellow sick brothers. And you make the most of it. And it's interesting. I remember when I, when I showed up, I, I approached them and they all shouted out, unclean. That's what you were called to do by the law. You had to declare that you had leprosy, that, that people couldn't be by you. And you had to call out, unclean, unclean. And I said, I'm with you guys. I found out this morning. I'm here to join you. And so I took on the, the appropriate dress code. Unkempt hair torn clothes, covering over our mouths, and the responsibility to always call out, unclean, unclean. And I sat with my, with my new family, and the overwhelming sense of loneliness just swallowed me whole. That's it. This is life. I didn't sleep again that night either.
the next morning, the next morning, the family came. They came. Now, the rule was you had to be at least six feet away. But I encouraged them to stay back even farther. They came in. They brought me meals. Caleb brought his cat. They brought me meals. And they brought me bandages. And, and Nama would make things with flowers and different things that she found and she would leave them for me and we would talk at a distance and we would be a family at a distance. But that was it. And the kids wanted to come and give me a hug and to sit on my lap, but they couldn't. And that was our life. And so day in and day out, she was a faith, she is a faithful wife that I love. She would come bring bandages and food. And, and that was what it was going to be. I didn't wish this upon them. So we had to re- restrain that, that distance. But I remember the day. It was so bizarre. The, 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 the group of us, the, the leper colony there, there was 15 and then there was 14 and then there was 13 and then there was 12. But the unique part about it is I was the only Samaritan. The others were Jews. But when you're on the bottom, you don't see differences. There was no tension. It it was interesting. I got to know my my fellow Jewish lepers. They're, They're nice guys. I mean, as nice as you can be. And so we made the best of it. The one Samaritan and the the 11 Jews. Well, I remember the day. Mary, Mary and she came, she came with the kids, well, her routine. But this day was different. She came a little earlier and she was running. She was running like a crazy woman. And when she got, she came too close. I said, get back. I said, stay back. She said, I'm sorry. I said, and she started just blabbering and just going, just, just talking gibberish and just going on and on and on. I said, I said slow down. I said, slow down. What's going on? What are you talking? And she started to tell me about, about Jesus and about how he had, he had encountered a, a man with leprosy and he went up to him and he touched him. And I, no, no one who is healthy touches a leper. You forfeit your life. No one does that. But she told me, uh, she told me how he, she, he touched him and healed him. And cured him of his leprosy. And, 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 and the guys came. I said, listen, listen to this story. And we started listening. And we said, tell us again. And she told us the details again. And, and there, was, there was hope. It was the first time we'd ever felt hope. That maybe, maybe if we met Jesus, we could be healed. And we could leave. We, we wouldn't have to be here anymore. Isolated from our families. Maybe we would, we would be able to be freed. And so we, we thought, we have to find, we've got to find Jesus. We've got to find this. When, when is he going to be by? We're, we, we've got to find him. And, and so we, we, we made a plan. We were outside of the city. We were going to look and watch 24-7, all, all day, all night, to see if Jesus was going to walk by or if anybody knew about him or if we had any information where we could go and we could find Jesus because this was the only hope that we had because outside of him... There's nothing. And so that was our plan. And, and, it, and it worked and we had different uh, routine and, and a shift. And, and a, a couple of guys, they didn't, they didn't make it. And it was, it was down to just nine of us. There were nine Jewish lepers and me, the Samaritan leper. And it, it went on and and it went on a little bit more and we were starting to lose hope because he wasn't showing up. And it was, it was, it was, it was challenging. But then the day that Miriam came again, she came again and she was blabbering and running again like she had the first time. And, and we were excited. Maybe Jesus was coming close. Maybe he was near. And she was telling about uh, uh, Lazarus and about Jesus raising him from the dead and that he was in big trouble with the priest. Now, it wasn't that clear of a sentence, of course, because she was excited, but she told us that Jesus raised a man from the dead who was dead for four days. We couldn't believe that. We, oh, this, he cures leprosy. He raises people from the dead. We can't lose hope, gentlemen. We have to find 
Jesus Christ. We have to find him. But then I said, wait, tell me that again, Mary. You said that the, the, religious, the, the religious leaders are mad at him? Why are they mad at him? Who could possibly be mad at a man who, who heals your life and restores you to your family and, and cures you? That makes no sense at all. But we had hope. So the 10 of us were gonna stick to our routine and we were gonna continue to look for Jesus, continue to watch for him, continue to listen for any information we had because we had to find Jesus. A few weeks passed. Miriam came in the morning with the kids, Caleb with his cat. Brought, brought my meal, brought my food, a couple more bandages, and they left. It was sometime in the afternoon. It was my turn to be watching. And I noticed a crowd of people. And I, re I really hoped that this was different than the normal crowd of people. Because when a Jewish rabbi would come by with his disciples, we had to yell out that we were unclean. And, and they didn't want to be defiled, and so they would keep their distance. Some would run from us, some would hide from us. There was one, I couldn't compose myself, there was one guy in particular, he would throw rocks at us to keep us at a distance. Really? I mean, do you have to do that? But that's what he did. And so I saw this crowd of people coming, and I thought, I really hope it's not the rock thrower. I, I really hope this is Jesus. And I'm looking, and I'm watching them come, and, and I get the, I got, guys, look, this is great. I got a lot of people, and I got, I got, it looks like a guy in the middle, the Jewish-looking rabbi, maybe. Oh, come on, let's be optimistic here. And as he approached, I, I really think it's him. And, and so we started calling out, Jesus, Master, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Have mercy on us. Save us, please, Jesus. Look at us. Save us. Touch our lives. Heal our lives, please, Jesus. And he stopped. And he looked at us. And he said, go. Show yourself to the priest. And, and I remember Arden, Arden said, What? This is the rock thrower. I'm not showing myself to the priest. This guy is setting us up to fail. He wants us to go into the temple and, and, and show ourselves to the priest. They're just going to yell at us and kick us back out. You need to cleanse us first. We need to be healed before we go. Jesus, do the miracle. If you're really Jesus, you need to heal us now. I'm not going. I'm not up to this, this trick. I'm not going to do this. And we all said, listen, we are going. This is the only hope we have. We are going to obey whatever that guy tells us to do. We are going to do it. You got a better plan? Well, that kept him quiet. And so we went. But the strange part was our group of 10 that had sh shrunken down to 10, we were about to part ways. Because you have to remember, I'm a Samaritan. I'm a Samaritan. I worship Yahweh God at Mount Gerizim. I don't worship in Jerusalem at the temple. <laughs> I don't go there. That'd be like a bad joke. A Samaritan leper walks into Jerusalem to the temple to see the priest. That doesn't go well, okay? I'm not going to do that. You guys go that direction, and I'll, I'll go mine. And it was weird because we were about to, to be healed. And the greatest thing ever, but we were about to separate ourselves and put those walls back up. I, oh, I, I wasn't going to. That's my family. Jew, Samaritan. One thing that this taught me, I don't see a difference. But they left. And I wondered, I wondered what it would have been like to be with them, to go to the temple and to show themselves to the priests. Because remember, the priests are really mad at Jesus. I can't figure that one out, but they're really mad at him. So that would have been kind of an awkward situation. But so they went off that way, and I went off this way. And I started to walk, and I, and I thought to myself, I'm not healed yet. I really hope this is going to work. I really hope this is going to work. And as I walked, I, I started to feel 
different. And, and I thought, this is just optimism. You're just, you're, just, you're just making yourself think that you're getting better. But, but I, I, I started to feel a change, and I thought, okay, this is either going to be a massive letdown or the best day of your life. And so I started with my arm because it was the worst. And I started to unwrap the bandage in my hand. I could stretch it out. See, leprosy attacks the nervous system and it curls your hand up. And you can't feel pain. And you hurt yourself because you, you have no pain. You, it's very, very dangerous. But it was, it was restored, it was new. And my hand looked new, and, and I wrapped up the rest of my arm, and my arm looked new. It looked good, and I said, "I said, this is this is this is un, this is unreal. No, no way." And I and I, and I whack, and I hit a tree, and I said, "Oh, that hurts! Oh, I can feel pain. This is good. I, I'm I'm healed." And I took the bandage off this one, and and they were both like new, and, and I was he I. As fast as I could, I ran to Mount Garrison to the temple. And I went into the priest and he, he, what are you doing? I said, I'm clean. Look, inspect. I'm clean. How, how did this happen? I looked at him and I said, Jesus. Jesus told me to go. And he made me, he made, he made me well. What, what am I doing here? Am I clean? Yes, you're clean. I gotta go. And I left. I left as quick as I could. I thought, what? I've just been healed from leprosy. And I didn't even say thank you. You gotta be kidding me. I ran back as quickly as I did a lot of running that day. I ran back as quickly as I could and I found Jesus. And I looked him in the eyes. And he knew who I was. And I looked him in the eyes. And I fell on my knees. I fell on my knees and I worshiped him. And I said, thank you so much for giving back my life. And I knew as I was, as I was, as I was kneeling down on the ground, I knew I put the dots together because only God could heal me. And Jesus healed me. So Jesus must be the prophet the one God spoke about. This is the one. And I thankfully worshiped him. And he looked at me and he said, where's the other nine? I don't know. I, 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 I thought they would have come back and said, thank you too. But I, I don't know where they went. And he looked at me and he said, go. Your faith has made you well. And he saved me twice. He saved me from my leprosy. And he saved me from my sin. And I got up off the ground. And I ran again. I told you I did a lot of running that day. And I ran right to my home. I had to find my wife and my kids. And I ran to the house. And Caleb was outside, and he was playing with the cat. And Caleb was outside, and I ran up, and he said, Dad? I said, son, this is grand. And I wrapped him up. I said, where's your mom? And they were inside. And I went in. She was so excited. I said, Jesus healed my life. And he saved my life. They gave me a second chance. I pray that you don't miss Jesus. That you don't miss Jesus. And that when you see him work in your life, you thank him. Yahweh God, you provide. And we thank you. And we serve you. Amen. If you have your Bibles, Luke 17. Luke 17. Young people in here, grab your Bibles. Let's look this one up. 
You split your Bible in half and then you split the, the section on the right in half again. If you land in something you can't pronounce, that's the Old Testament. You know, cruise over to the New Testament. You got Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those are the Gospels. Luke chapter 17. Uh, verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him, and they stood at a distance. And they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. We're in verse 14. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet, and he thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. I am... Uh, I enjoy this story. I enjoy this story. And I look into it, and I read it, and I listen to it, and I think of the compassion that Jesus has. The compassion that Jesus has for everyone. Jew, Samaritan, doesn't matter. Wherever you're at right now, call out to Jesus, and he will have compassion on you. I, I look at this story, and I see the obedience, the simple obedience. Just do what he says. Do what he says. And when we stop and think about all that he's done for us, we have to fall at his feet and say thank you. Jesus has saved my life from sickness. He has saved my life by, by blessing me. He has saved me time and time and time again. And he has saved me from my sins. So I fall on my face and I worship and I say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. God, we love you, and we praise you, and we do, we truly say thank you for all that you have done. God, I pray that you will give us a heart of gratitude, a heart that looks for all the blessings that you have given to us and appreciates those blessings. Thanks for loving us, God. God, I pray right now for those who are sick, those who are are in bondage to sin, to say yes to your name. Amen. The lepers were isolated. They were cast aside because of their sickness. If you're in sin, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, if you've never had your sins forgiven and been filled with the Holy Spirit, then you are isolated. You are outside. You have not received the healing that only Jesus Christ can give, and my heart breaks for you. Accept Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life today. Be part of his family. He calls you to come home. We're gonna stand and we're gonna sing our song of invitation. Dan, if you could come forward. If you need to make a decision, come forward, talk with Dan. He's one of the elders. Um, if you need to just come up and, and spend some time praying, we encourage you to do that too. But let's stand and let's sing our song of invitation this morning.